Thanks for tuning in to Talking Point. I'm your host, Neeraj Shah. And uh, I want to start the show with something that uh, Uday Kotak uh, put out on uh, the social media platform X yesterday, wherein he spoke about how, uh, because of the inflation print that has come out, rate cuts get pushed to the very least at November, globally, including India. Maybe they coincide with the US elections, which makes the whole piece very, very interesting, if you will. I'm not saying it verbatim, but that the implication of that tweet. And I reckon that he mentioned that uh, get ready for global turbulence. And now, it's pertinent because that is what seemingly is happening over the last 48 hours. Geopolitics, crude, uh, equity markets being very choppy, and gold, a lead indicator of what the safety prognosis of the investing world might be, knocking on new highs yet again. Somebody who is best placed to put correlate all of this and giving the Indian context as well is Devi Namera, founder and chairperson and MD of First Global. And it's absolute delight to have Devina in our studios. Devina, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Neeraj, for having me. No, the pleasure is entirely ours, I must say. Devina, I just wonder though, uh, would, would investors by and large have a, a fairly pleasurable next few months or are there clouds on the horizon? So you're talking globally or India? Globally, let's start with global. I would love to talk global with you first. Right. So globally, I am quite positive on the equity side. Uh, I was a little uh, more nervous middle of last year when the entire move was very, very tech-led. If you look at US, for instance, from January to October 2023, not just a NASDAQ, which is anyway a tech index, S&P, 90% of the move was only seven stocks, 89% to be exact. And most companies, most stocks underperformed. I mean, they were, I think, something like 70% which were down. So it was, it was very, very skewed. So it's always scary when the markets are that narrow. But thereafter, they started to broaden, and which is uh, uh, playing out, and uh, which is actually good for our strategy, which is a diversified strategy. And uh, now the small and mid-cap indices in the US are actually beginning to look pretty good. So uh, not just the US, there are other pockets. I mean, last year, for example, in the beginning, we were tracking Japan for a turn. And which happened so uh, last April onwards for a year now we've been overweight Japan, Taiwan. So there have been pockets. India also we think will be over a period of time in the outperforming bucket, even though we see some uh, shorter term volatility. So that's uh, broadly where we see things. In terms of you were talking about the Fed. Uh, now I have never been in that. Uh, uh, basket which has actually been the consensus that uh, rate cuts would happen soon. Uh -huh. So if you go back to beginning of 23, people were thinking that there would be rate cuts in 23 itself, which I always said are not going to happen. This year at the beginning it was that rate cuts will begin in March, yeah. which again I never believed. Because you look at it historically, every time inflation is this high, it takes years, not months or quarters to come down. So it was very clear that you know, before 2025 it's not going to happen. And uh, if you look at the print this time, of course, you know, the, what the Fed tracks is the, what they call uh, non-shelter uh, uh, services. Hmm. So that has been, uh, that has come up ahead of expectation. Again, not unexpected because services, if you think about it, have a large labor component. And the labor market in the U.S. has never been anything other than buoyant. So obviously, you know, the, lab, the that part is not coming down. Now, of course, since the commodities are going up, that's an additional push to inflation because you got that low hanging fruit in the beginning because the commodities uh, prices had come down. So those are the things which will uh, uh, push inflation. And while the Fed might look at core inflation, which is uh, excluding food and fuel, you talked of the elections for the politicians, food and fuel is relevant both here and in the US because for the consumer food and fuel is relevant. It may not be amenable to, uh, to a, a change in the Fed rate, but still, you know, you can't ignore it. Yeah. It leads to changes in governments for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Devina, um, how, there is, there is this, train of thought which also says that look at the US Fed uh, or you guess the US balance sheet and how indebted it is and therefore how how can such a nation live with such high interest rates and some point of time that compulsion as opposed to inflation management 
will take center stage. You agree? I mean, first of all, it is their, the debt is in their own currency, which is something not every nation in the world has. Enjoys, yeah. And uh, the debt has been there. I mean, this debt question has been there forever. So again, what happens in the market is what drives the narratives rather than the other way around. So, you know, as I, like I gave an example in a tweet a few days ago that if the markets uh, go up, you will say that the growth is great and that's why markets are going up. If they go down, it would, might be that, uh, you know, that the growth is great and therefore the Fed rate cut won't come. So you will have an explanation either way. There's a book called Everything is Obvious Once You Know the Answer. So, so the narratives we try to fit is often that. So if you go back to, let's say, 2003 to seven, hmm. uh, the emerging markets went up three and a half, four times. India went up six, seven times. But uh, that time, because the US was not doing well, it had not come out of even after post the tech crash, it took it years to come back. You know, NASDAQ did not take out its 2000 high till 2015 in, in a sustained basis. So it was like US is over. Now it is a century of India and China. That's when BRICS was coined. And once the US started to outperform again, all that was forgotten. So, you know, every time something happens, you have a narrative that US car story is over, that, you know, de dollarization will happen, yeah, this yeah, will all happen, that. Sure, all sure. that will happen. But, you know, that, that's not something I buy into. So, if, if rate cuts are not a necessity in 2024, right. yeah. I'm not saying that they won't happen at all in uh, you think they might happen. Four, huh? But I'm saying just it might it get, get pushed. pushed out. And also, I can't say for sure sitting here today because the Fed also doesn't know for sure because okay. all central banks are now very data driven. Sure. There have been banks which cut rates and again raise them. Two, three of yeah, them yeah. did that. So yeah, yeah. that also happens. So now the central banks don't even go by what they said last time. I mean, they really say that forget about what we said. Now this is the data and this is what we are doing. Look at what we do, don't look at what <laughs> we say. Okay, great. But right. let's assume that if, if there is a period of delayed rate cuts or maybe at the end of December when we are having this conversation, maybe there are no rate cuts that have happened. Right. Uh, how would you think uh, uh, global equity markets behave in, in such a scenario? Because we have geopolitics, we have higher crude prices, uh, and, and, and of course, uh, I mean, uh, crude notwithstanding, just the higher rates and low growth, presume, presume, unless growth, of course, picks up, China, others notwithstanding. How do equity markets behave then? So growth is not that, that bad, bad as expected. In fact, that's the reason inflation is, remains right. high. I mean, that's what I said, that you can pick up whichever side of the equation you want and explain what's happening in the uh, okay, market. Agreed. So so, uh, so growth has not been bad. And I don't think, you know, I, uh, our uh, scenarios are that growth is crashing anytime soon. China, you mentioned, if you look at China, again, markets and growth, economic growth are two different things. Yeah, China's yeah. high was in 2007. The GDP is up seven times since, but it is where it is. So it, like that, that's the biggest poster child for, you cannot draw a one-to-one -one uh, between, between the macro and what happens in the markets. Okay, so then what happens to equity markets from now on until whenever the rate cuts happen? So, I mean, as I said, I, I'm quite uh, positive still on the global equity markets and uh, U.S. also is looking fine now as against last year when it was giving me a bit of the jitters. And uh, the other markets, we continue to like Japan, we continue to like Taiwan, we like a couple of the, uh, the European markets. Uh, more uh, and and as I said, uh, India also from a one-year perspective looks good. May not be necessarily from a two-month perspective. What what is, what is bothering you about the two-month perspective? Only that there might be volatility. You know, I think up till the election you might see volatility, but it is. I'm I'm just saying that maybe uh, I, we haven't taken that call yet whether to be hedged or not. But we're definitely not making a cash call. So you know there is still a risk of missing out on the up move. So. You know, when, when there is a little bit of a risk of volatility, we'd rather hedge than be out of the market because as I always say that uh, there is a risk to being invested in the market, but there's also a risk to not being invested. Yeah. So because you you might miss out on an up move. So. What, what, could, what could lead to this? Would it idiosyncratic growth related factors lead to India up more? Would India be a part of a rising tide globally carrying all boats higher from where they are right now? No, I think India will be an outperformer, as I said, on a one-year basis. So it's, it is more to do with the history of India. What uh, If you look at uh, equity markets, we all know this 15, 16% compounding is what happened from the time since I started, and that's what we hope for or what we plan for. 
but uh, there was a whole decade 2010 to 20 hmm. when the compounding was only 8.8% which is just you know trifle about the fd rates of that time the fixed deposits used to be close to 8% those days so you got no return equity returns in dollar terms there was hardly any compounding for that entire decade i think zero uh, percent or two percent something mm. like that so that is what created the room so even now if you look at the mainstream indices you are not above the trend line the risk of a big crash comes when you're way above the trend line you're still not even at the trend line so that's why you know, as i said the risk of being out of the market is more than being invested but of course there are the frothy areas and there are the micro caps and sme and very small small caps so those things are where you should be careful okay i'll probe that in a moment on the other side of the break but just one quick question there's so many people who are skeptical currently on the markets who bring out um some signposts that have been used for a while ke pan wala bhi jab bolta hai ke stock khareedna chahiye to it's a caution look at the valuations at the small cap and something that you refer to look at the fact that promoter bech raha hai ye bech raha hai pe bech raha hai khareed raha kon retail retail investor khareed raha hai all of these are telltale signs that the markets will correct you don't agree so as i said that you have to look at the market on a two tier basis that what what is the mainstream indices the large cap and more stable companies and you have to look at the frothy end of the market and i often say people who have come into the markets in the last two years think that think that small caps always do well or they do but uh, if you look at the small cap index itself uh, went down nearly 80% in 2008 9 78% to be exact it took out that high in 2016 which is also a theoretical high because by that time the index was completely different you had this mad bull run in small caps if you remember another year and a half and then 2018 one more crash almost two thirds and i said don't forget your high school mathematics or even your primary school arithmetic that if something falls two thirds it will triple and you are at zero so all the micro cap managers who are now saying 50% 60% compounding for 2 years or 3 years but the same people who had brought you down to near zero or down 90% and from there even with that 50% compounding you are still not back yeah. to 100 <laughs> you know so so that so small caps those are the risks the, and and unlike large caps you can't manage risk in a small cap with a stop loss or something because when the, those stocks fall there is no exit India is not top of the pecking order, I reckon. Not right now, as I said, just because I expect some volatility till the elections are over. But on a one-year basis, India would be amongst yeah. there. Yes, India is in the outperform. Outperform, outperform. yeah, basket. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, would it be earnings growth that will drive that? Because with valuations where they are, they are not outlandishly high, but they are high. Right. So, would earnings growth complement this, or would you believe that there could be a further up move of the multiples, or a combination of both? It would probably be a combination. I do. I mean, again, if depends also on partly on commodity prices. If the commodity prices remain high, then that hurts the margins. And one of the, of course, uh, if you look at the macroeconomic situation, uh, you, you look at the consumption growth that has not been high. So that's uh, while the headline GDP number looks very good, it's there's really a single engine which is the government expenditure which is driving that and. Uh, consumption expenditure is at a 21 year kind of low so last time it was this low was 2002 3 so last print i saw for consumption was less than 3% growth so large parts of the economy are hurting so so uh, consumption themes which want to go below the affluent consumer there is an issue because the as you would have seen all the inequality report that inequality has been increasing so Uh, the plus of course from if you're looking at a purely market point of view is that uh, the listed companies cater more to the affluent customer and therefore uh, it may not be bad for them but still i mean that there are some which cater to the whole market so that that becomes the issue and uh, if you look at for example real estate i mean not that we are positive on real estate but just as an example that real estate uh, the listed companies uh, if you look at they will be dealing only with the affluent customer not with so it doesn't matter if real estate in general is doing well or not and so the those are the things so in terms of what we like in uh, so you have to choose carefully again you know it's not market multiples i am a little skeptical in talking always i mean this is not now yeah. for like 30 years whenever people ask me what's the nifty earnings growth for example 
So that gets skewed by two, three large companies and there are like all kinds of things. If you look at the Nifty itself, if you look at the sectoral uh, breakup, it has changed so much over the years. At one point, point of banks and financials were at zero or near zero. Now that's the largest uh, chunk, for example. If you look at IT services, they used to be much higher. Now they are lower. Something else, you know, PSUs people uh, who are been in the market only five, seven years don't know this, but the mainstream indices at one point had so many PSUs: yeah. BHEL, uh, VSNL, MTNL, ONGC, Indian Oil. HPCL, BPCL, and then there came a, a time when people forgot that PSUs exist. So, so the uh, the composition changes. So it's very difficult to just do a PE comparison, or even just look at the entire Nifty earnings growth. Uh, so you really have to drill down because you are not uh, buying that. You are you you're buying something else. So you have to uh, decide on the sectors and the companies which you have to choose carefully. Got it. Okay. So did I hear you say you're not constructive? Sorry, I'm starting with the micro thing, but I picked it up from your answer. Yeah. Not constructive real estate. Real estate, it's not that, um, it is just that uh, it's a high risk sector. So we always manage for risk first. So we are always, uh, you know, as I repeat often enough, investing is a loser's game. So you win if you don't lose. So the first rule is not to take high risk with somebody else's hard-earned money. So that's the first thing we manage for. So that's, I mean, we always manage for not just the returns, but yeah. returns versus volatility, returns versus drawdowns. So the returns should come with low blood pressure, not high <laughs> blood pressure. <laughs> yeah, and the rule number two, as Warren Buffett says, don't forget rule number one. <laughs> so that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I just thought, Devina Mehra often says that, well, when I say that, uh, in God we trust, everyone must bring data. Devina says even God must bring data. I thought the data around real estate looked okay. But I get your point, the nature yeah. of the beast. So what what uh, what enthuses you? There are There is very starkly divided opinion amongst the heavyweight sectors, particularly information technology. Uh, so can I start off with that? It's pertinent today. Yeah, so IT, I think some time this year, it will bottom out and mm -hmm. will give a buy signal. I mean... That's uh, what my guess is. We are not overweight yet, uh, but we are not, you know, we are up, I think, around market weight, maybe a percent uh, less or something like that. So, uh, but that's not a sector that, like a lot of others, kind of wrote off that sector. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the case. It's a, still a fairly predictable sector. And again, the narratives change, you know, that 2022 people, when IT had started underperforming, at that time the logic was that the whole world is digitizing, even non-tech companies are becoming tech companies, there's so much demand for technology, so much demand for technology people that these guys will never get the people they want yeah. or the salaries will go up, margins will get squeezed. Now it has become that, you know, this is a pathetic sector and there, there'll be no demand ever. So, so those are, and people don't even realize that you're giving two exactly opposite narratives a year, year and a half apart for the same phenomena. True. So, uh, Which is a multi-year phenomenon also. Yeah, sure. so I mean the fact is the world is digitizing, the world will move more and more to technology. There's been a change and I don't know whether it will, therefore IT services may not remain as people intensive. So if I'm looking uh -huh. at employment, it might be a different story. But to say these people will not have the business or not have the growth beyond like a, a small hitch in the middle because you know when things, when the uh, consuming company, countries uh, slow down, what happens often is that your sales cycle gets extended, your deals don't close, they, they get you know pushed by two quarters or something, but doesn't mean that that business will disappear. I'm not of that view at all. Got it, okay. And, and, and this recent glo glo uptick in global growth, which is looking resilient, could that bring about a return of discretionary spending as well, you reckon, or no, no not necessarily? You're talking in... No global more. growth? So looking. for the for the technology side, yeah. yes. I mean, there are some of the discretionary projects which got like kind of push. I think eventually people have to do those. Yeah, yeah. It's not like a, got it. a forever thing that they, you'll never uh, do that tech spend. Got it. What does Devina Mehra like the most within this Indian landscape? Okay, so uh, one sector which we've been overweight uh, a long, long time, which is since October 21. So two and a half years has been capital goods industrial machinery, which most people started talking of only in 2023. But our systems had signaled it after like 12 years as a dog sector from 2009 to 21, it turned and how. 
So we have been trimming, we have been changing and I do not know whether how long this will last. So I mean we are a lot lower than where we were but uh, we are still overweight that sector significantly right. and sometime maybe I do not know sometime that story will be over because a large part of the story has played out but we are still overweight. Uh, the sectors we have been overweight from beginning of 2023 have been autos and pharma hmm. and in this rebalance also we have added some names there. I was so, about to ask that to you because yeah. the last time we spoke, we spoke before your quarterly rebalance. Yeah, so You're saying in the quarterly rebalance you've we've, added auto and pharma. We've added a little bit more in these two. Uh, we've also added in metals. Uh -huh. so, uh, so Does that make you uh, a Actually, even China before growth? our rebalance, toward the end of the um, end of March itself, we added. But is that a, a China return which prompts you to do this or something else? I mean, the, the signals are there that the, the, the metal prices are firming. You know, for whatever, of course, your China is a big player on the demand side, so that's part of the story. But you know, it is also that overall the prices are looking better. Uh, construction would be a little overweight. I think that would be broadly where we are overweight. Okay, sorry, just a quick follow up, Devina, excuse huh? me. But metals, I mean, do cycles, because you look at cycles so closely, do metal cycles in metals last uh, for a very brief period, or would they be lasting? Just trying to understand that could this uptick be sustained? Yeah. See, in commodities, you never know sustained. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I am not a believer in these super cycles and all of okay. that because, uh, you know, again, these are just narratives. And commodities is one area where a bull market hurts a lot more people than it benefits. So it's not a bull market that everybody loves. But for now, it's looking fine. And we were very underweight also in metal. So that was also, uh, we've added one or two cement companies also, but I don't think we'll be overweight there. Got it. My final question is that's on the behemoth sector. I mean, BFSR, you've had very contrarian views in the past. Uh, uh, I think you told me last time that maybe at the margin, you've changed a little bit, but I'm just trying to understand BFSI. BFSI, I'm I'm a nervous investor in yeah, banks and right. lenders. As I keep repeating, yes, people yes. tell me that you repeat it in every interview of yours. But I said that's I the truth. I'm just trying to understand. Post so I mean, balance. we are we are still underweight, underweight. banks quite significantly. Okay. Within banks, we are more oriented towards PSU banks. So that's the part we like better still. Got it. Yeah, I just wanted to get that. Uh, post the quarterly rebalance, since I don't know the stance, yeah, yeah. didn't know the stance then. Devina, before we wrap up. Um, You've been a big fan of Daniel Kahneman. Right. Uh, um, God bless his soul, of course. He did wonders to us. One key learning from everything that you've read, heard, uh, seen about him, one key learning that you've imbibed in your investing career uh, as a result of uh, studying his work. He says in every field of human endeavor where judgment is involved, a system will outperform the so-called expert. So, you know, this this I read afterwards, but we had already implemented. I said, because human beings cannot eliminate bias. They cannot eliminate the randomness, what he calls noise in their judgment. So the only way to do it is with the system. Okay, Devi Navena, such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for taking the time out and being with us today. Really uh, appreciate this and look forward to reading your book as it gets published soon. Uh, thank you, Neeraj. Thank you. Great being here and chatting with you. Uh, always a pleasure. And viewers, watch out for that book. It'll be, uh, I'm, I'm sure it'll be a bestseller. And we'll, of course, talk about that book with Devina when it does get released. So thanks so much for tuning into this edition of The Talking Point.